Thank you very much. You be seated. It just makes my heart feel real good to be back in New York tonight. I've always got such a thrill of coming to New York. I like all of the states, but there's just something about New York that seems to grip me. And the people and their hospitality. Being a southerner, I say you have to come up here in the north to find what southern hospitality means. Come to the north. I wish to take this time to thank Mr. Uh, Lloyd Sweet and all the those who are affiliated with the the Harvest Evangelism to the World Harvest Evangelism for their kindness of uh, sponsoring us through this New England uh, campaign. And we are very grateful for all they have done. And trust that the good Lord of heaven will just pour out his blessings upon the effort and send the harvest of souls into the kingdom of God in their efforts. And I want to thank these ministers tonight here in New York City. I come to the platform and the chairs were lined with ministers. That's cooperating ministers. Thank you, my brethren, for dismissing your churches and coming out here to help make this a great rally. I sure appreciate it and trust that God will richly bless you in every way in your ministry. Hoping sometime, I've always wanted a time that when we could set a great rally in New York and just uh, the full gospel people all get together like the Baptists and those did for Billy Graham and, and just have a great rally with all the people, the, the, the Spanish and everyone together. Why, we can do that and God would just rain down his blessings upon us, I'm sure, if we would just do that. And now, I'm certainly grateful for it this evening. I'm tired. I've been preaching and having healing services about every day and night. Not every day, but every night and some of the days since I left. I'm about the longest I ever went in one time. And I'm really tired. Just a little hoarse. But very happy in my heart to report to you that there has been great things accomplished for our dear Lord in these New England states. Just to give you a little view of some of the brethren hasn't spoke of it. I was in the meeting one night when a lady died sitting over to my left and a doctor there went to find pulp in her and it was gone. To see the great Holy Spirit turn and call that woman's name and wake her up again. That happened in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, just things like that that he's been doing. Then it was up in Burlington, New Hampshire where there was a lady, just just one of the cases, she was sitting back and the dear soul, she couldn't get a prayer card to get in the line, so she just bowed her humble little head and started praying. I believe she was an epileptic. And the Lord Jesus, with his grace, moved over there and told her that she was healed of this epilepsy and said, also, your husband is uh, given up in some uh, hospital at he has a disease that the doctors cannot cure. There's nothing can be done, and they give him up. But said, don't worry, for thus saith the Lord, he's just been healed. And the epilepsy left her immediately, and when she got home the next morning, her husband called her. The doctors had taken him in for a final and could find nothing of it at all. He's on his road home, just rejoicing. Oh, we have such a lovely father, don't we? He's so good, and we just love him so much. And now, it's uh, good to be here tonight and all this fine fellowship and, and I'm, some of our friends I got to meet today, Captain Julius Stadscliffe, all the way from Mo Mohammed Desert or Mojave Desert in California. He's the chaplain in the army that was with me in Africa that wrote the book. And he's here somewhere tonight. And... Uh, then also that the Pastor Bose is here from Chicago, from the Philadelphian Church, and and just many good friends. And I wonder if Miss Isaacson is here tonight. She was here the last time I 
Just got to wave at her when she left the platform. She's my voice of Finland. And I don't know whether she... Are you here, Miss Isaacson? Raise up your hand if you are. She come off the platform the last evening I was here, and uh, I didn't get to see her. And uh, she's a lovely person. And just uh, Mr. Cox called me from over in Indiana, up around Hammond, is up here tonight. And we're happy for all of you, just very happy to have this time of fellowship. And God bless you. And Billy told me as I come out the door just now, he said, Daddy, they're taking you up a, a love offering tonight. I wasn't expecting that, friend. And, but if you did it, it's already, I couldn't get it back now because I wouldn't know how to give it back. But thank you real kindly. And I'll assure you by the grace of God, I'll spend every cent of it to the kingdom of God, the best of my knowledge, to do that. Thank you kindly, and I just trust that God will repay you a hundredfold for every bit of it. And now when we leave here, we're on our road next Sunday, not this coming Sunday, the following Sunday at Dallas, Texas, and a big convention. Then from there we go up to, to North or South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, Interdenominational Ministerial Association Convention. And then from there we're going to Green Pines, North Carolina, in a Baptist rally. And then from there, right back over to Philadelphia here in the Full Gospel Christian Businessmen's Convention. And we're just scattering around, trying to do what we can, because we believe that the Lord is coming soon. And we want to do everything we can while it's daylight and we can work. And in appreciation of all that's been done, I praise God for every bit of it who has made it possible that these things could be done. Now, just before we read his word, let us bow our heads and speak to him just a moment. Blessed Lord, when I think of your goodness and the souls that have been saved in these past few days, the thousands that have come to the meeting and been helped, I, I just forget about being tired. And then to be here tonight and to Feel your spirit moving in these people, knowing that they're your beloved, blood-washed people. And I thank you for each and every one of them. And I would pray, God, tonight that you would just do something special for us. We're sitting here under great anticipation. We're waiting and longing for that hour when the veil will be pulled back. We shall see him, and how we love him, and would love to fall on our faces and just touch his feet, for we love him. And Father, I pray that you will bless every person here and every minister, every pastor, evangelist, missionary, whatever. Grant that their churches will prosper and their work for the Lord will increase and many souls may be saved, and something might be done tonight that would help us to take a new hold and start new again. Grant it, Father. Now we have opened up the lids of your Bible, and now interpret for us, Father. May the Holy Spirit speak in such a way tonight that when we go to our different places, may we say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? For we ask it in Jesus' name, thy Son, Amen. I wish to read tonight, being at the meeting is just a little on its way now, not to take too much time. We got around a thousand miles to drive right away. And I want to read from the book of St. Mark, the twelfth chapter, the eleventh chapter, rather, of St. Mark, and the twenty-second verse. And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. This little word, faith, have faith in God. And for a, a subject, I would like to use this, time-tested faith, those three words, time-tested faith. It's just three words, but oh, what it means. And I am told in the Old Testament that 
faith in the Old Testament was the same way it is in the New Testament. So many people stumble at the thought of faith, but it's so simple to have faith. For instance, you cannot move out of your seat if you were able to come in and sit down. You cannot move from your seat unless you have faith that you'll do it. You cannot put your hat on again unless you have faith you can do it. Never can you draw another breath unless you have faith you can do it. Faith is so common that when we look at it for something a little unusual, we go way over the top of it, trying to find it's what right next to us. Now, in the Old Testament, when the blood was applied over the, the lintels of the door, I'm told it was put on by Hossus, dipped in the blood and rubbed over the door. Hossus is just common weed. And that's how it was applied by Hossus, something you could just reach down anywhere and get a handful of it. And how appropriate that is tonight to apply hossip as faith. You put the blood on by faith. How we're covered by the blood, by faith, common faith. Well, you say, but for miracles and for healing, Brother Branham, is some different type of faith. No, it's the same faith. There's only one faith. And all good things and all things that are, are original, all evil is just righteousness perverted. Sickness is health perverted. And everything that's wrong is right being perverted. Well, what perverted it was Satan. And Jesus died that he might give us the power through his blood to correct that thing that's wrong, bring sinners back to salvation, sickness back to health, unrighteousness back to righteousness. See, it's just that simple. And many times we go over it, looking to see, honey, oh, if I could only do this. You could if you just don't be excited about it. As I just was hearing Dr. Vale as I was leaving, saying that my ministry was changing, oh, I'm so happy. Not this isn't going to leave, it'll remain always, but it's going to be something greater. Last evening when we were going from the building after a little child had been so very disturbing, mentally gone. And the little mother could not even hold it in the building. It was just kicking and screaming and all carrying on awful. And she'd take it outside and I could hear it way down the hall. And then after this, the Lord had did great things on the road out. There the little mother was holding that poor little middle baby. Its little eyes almost out on its cheeks. Its little mouth drawn sideways and it was kicking and screaming, and when I come up, it just went into a tantrum. But oh, that blessed something, the presence of the Holy Spirit. I said to Mr. Vale and to Billy, who were taking me out, I said, here is the new coming, and caught the little fellow by the arm and said, dear God, let it return normal, and it stopped and looked up at me and smiled. And the mother picked it up and left the building. In our scripture tonight, the previous chapters, Jesus had said to a tree, No fruit grow on thee, or no man eateth from thee. Then he said after this verse, If you say to this mountain, be moved. Now if I say, if you say to this mountain, be moved. Now, we know that man could not move a mountain just by speaking to it. The only thing could do that would be deity. So then, if the mountain is before us, and our objective is right, and our motive is right, 
then it isn't us speaking anymore, it's deity speaking. Then it has to move. I truly believe that the church is on the brink of one of the greatest outpourings that it's ever had in this age. I believe it. I can't say the Lord has told me, but it's just something inside me, just catching a hold of something that I haven't seen all my life till just now. And how glorious it is to know just before the coming of the Lord that these things are happening. Now, faith is so simple. The Scripture says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith is not a myth. It's something that you actually possess. Just like this, if I had a... If I was starving and, and I, you come to me and I said, I'm starving, you say, what would save your life? I'd say, a loaf of bread. And you'd go into your pocket and bring out 25 cents and hand it to me and say, here you are, Mr. Brandon, you don't have to starve. Well, I haven't got the bread yet, but I've got the purchase power of the bread. Now, I may be a mile from the bread, but I can be just as happy with that quarter in my hand as I can when I got the bread in my hand, because I've got the purchase power of the bread. And when faith is anchored that it's finished, you're just as happy as if you're already jumping and shouting, because it's all over. You have it. It's something you know you've got. Nothing can move it. You never watch for any um, uh, evidences or anything else. You just know you have it. Now, when I got this bread, this 25 cents, I may have to go over some hills, go through a briar patch, across some water, and might have to cross bridges. But all the time I'm rejoicing because I've got the 25 cents, knowing I'm going to get the bread just as soon as I get there. It's the purchase power. Well, faith is the purchase power of things you hope for. That is genuine faith. Nothing can move it. Now, the most people have faith, but they just don't try to use what faith they've got. I believe that every person that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ has to have a certain amount of faith. But the reason that it's never used too much, it's because you never put it to use very much. A person usually coming to church will just come in and listen to a sermon, and then they'll go up and put their name on the church book and become a good member of that church. That's just about as far as they ever have the opportunity to use their faith. Now, faith will just do anything that you have a need of being done if you'll put it to work. But most churches today, they, that's as far as they teach. Just accept Jesus by faith, and that settles it. That's like a man was that was eating a slice of watermelon. He said that was good, but there's some more of it somewhere. So that's the way it is to accept Christ is good, but there's more of it. And then... When a man accepts Christ as his personal Savior, then all the good things that God has promised is laying right at his fingertips, just to believe it. Now, don't go at it in a place where you're just, I wonder if it'll work, just the same as you know you're going to get a drink of water. You're going to raise up and walk across the floor. That's just how simple to be about it. Well, the Lord promised it, that settles it, and just go on about it. That's real, genuine faith. Now, if people would put, if the church would put more uh, faith to work, you'd see more things taking place in the church. The pastor might stand on Sunday morning. He might stand on Sunday evening or whenever and preach hard on faith and a mighty message. But if the members don't take that message and then start putting it to work, It'll fall right back in the birds of the air. I'll pick it up. See? Just take it out and put it to work. God wants you to do it. Now, faith, always an experience, accompanies faith. 
Now, how could it be tonight? I'd say to you women here that you've got little canary birds and so forth that you love, little pets. What good would it do for you to give them all the vitamins that you can in their seeds to make big, strong bones and, and, and fine wings and so forth if you keep them in the cage all the time? See? There's no need of giving him vitamins if you're going to keep him in a cage. He don't need the vitamins to make strong wings because he's never got a chance to use them. What good does it do to preach a Bible of a God that heals, of a God that got power, and tell the people that the days of miracles is past? What good does it do to send ministers to seminaries and to colleges and so forth and learn all these different things and then, then come tell the people that's something that was, it isn't anymore? It's just like taking a man freezing to death and say, here's a nice picture of a big painted fire. The man cannot get warm by a painted fire. He's freezing and he's got to have warmth. And a man that's thirsting for God can't be satisfied till something happens. It's an experience. And that kind of an experience will bring forth great faith. You never know what it is. You cannot trust God who you have never met. For instance, one time in the Bible, Israel was called out in war against the Philistines. And they were standing over on a hill, and Israel had uh, gathered themselves across the valley over on the other side. And of course, just like the devil, when he thinks he's got the bluff on you, He'll just call your hand to anything. And they had a great, big, prehistoric giant over there by the name of Goliath. His fingers is 14 inches long, and he had a spear like a weaver's needle, perhaps from here to the steps. And he's made a proposition with the people of Israel. He said, how cunning sin is. He said, let's not have any bloodshed now. He said, there's no need of everybody getting all butchered up in this war. You look you out a man over there and let him come over here and fight me. And if I whip him, you serve us. And if he whips me, then we'll serve you. Now, that's the way the devil does it when he thinks he's got the upper hand. If there was any man in the whole army of Israel that was able to fight this giant with Saul, he was head and shoulders above his entire army. He was a warrior from his youth. He knew how to handle a shield, a spear, how to maneuver that spear out of another man's hands. He taught man. Oh, he was a bishop. He knew how to teach all the theology. But the thing of it was he never had had any experience of meeting God with it. And this big giant come out every day and made his boast. But one day he made his boast once too often. There was a little ruddy-looking fella, stoop-shouldered and hair hanging in his eyes, come up into the camp to visit his brethren. He had some raisin pie and so forth his daddy had sent up there to the boys. And his name was David. He was a little sheep herder. And when he heard this giant come out there and said, What you going to do about it, fellas? He said it at the wrong time. It fell on the ears of somebody who knew God. He said, Do you mean to tell me that the armies of the living God will stand here and let that uncircumcised Philistine defy these armies? I wonder today how it could be that the uncircumcised could raise up and stand in the midst of a day when Jesus Christ is manifesting himself on earth with an open Bible. You mean that this uncircumcised world of all of these uh, theology and educations and so forth, that I'd stand still when my God lives and defy God's holy word never. 
If I had to sink in my tracks, I would take God and stand on His Word. Why? These ministers will do the same thing. Why? The same reason David said what he did. Let them call them holy rowers. Let them call them whatever they may call them. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> oh, you say, but this fellow's an archbishop. He might be a pope, but that don't make any difference. David didn't have all the training that, that Saul had had, and he was just a little bitty runt. But he was, the Bible said he was ruddy, just a little feller. I was a little sheepskin coat on, a little, you know, like little panty waist, we call them. And here he was standing there looking up at his brothers and said, You mean that you'll let that uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? Said, I'll go fight him. Oh, that was a courage. God, give us some more David today. That's what we need. What was David talking from? And his brother said, oh, I know you want to be naughty. We just know you're coming up here with that naughtiness in your voice, so we're going to send you back home. And he got around to Saul. So Saul called him up and wanted to know who this stripling was. And they brought him up there in the presence of Saul. And, and Saul said, you can't fight that man. said, you're nothing but a youth. And he's a warrior from his youth. And he said, I want you to notice what David said. Saul said, just a minute. If you want to go, I'll, I'll fix you up. So he took his own shield off and handed it over to David and put his armor on David. And could you imagine what his helmet looked? That big head of Saul's and that hat sitting down over the top of little David's ears and the shoulders about this wide and the shield of Armor about that wine, while the poor little fella couldn't hold it up. That's trying to put doctor's degrees on a man of God. And Saul found out that his theological best didn't fit a man of God. He said, take the thing off of me. I don't know nothing about it. How to stand up and repeat the Apostles' Creed so-called and say, Amen. Why, he didn't know nothing about that. He said, but let me go with something that I know what I'm talking about. God knows that's what we need tonight, is man in the army of God who knows what they're talking about. Not whether they have a doctor's degree or what, they might not know their ABCs. But they know Christ, and that's the main thing. David said, I've had an experience. I had an experience of this power that I'm speaking of. One day I was back out there on the back side of the desert herding my daddy's sheep, and a bear run in and got one, and I just took the slingshot and knocked him down with it, stuck it out of his mouth, and said a lion came in and got one, and I knocked him down, and he raised up against me, and I, I slew him. Why, he said, the God that delivered them out of my hands won't he much more deliver that uncircumcised Philistine that's defying the armies of the living God? If God delivered you from sin, how much more will he deliver you from your sickness? He's able to take and change your nature and make you a new person. Why would you fear about any sickness? If he can save your soul and change your nature, change your motives, change your ideas, how much more can he change your sickness into health and put it back in its right place again for it belongs? It's just so simple that we go over the top of it. There. And, of course, he said, I admire your courage, son, but it's your own death. So he took his little slingshot and got five rocks, put one in and Goliath made fun of him. I want you to watch. He had five rocks. And you boys know what an old slingshot is. 
piece of leather, and why well, we used to be able to knock a snake doctor off the fence with it just as easy as we could be. And then we'd, that's five fingers, five rocks, F-A-I-T-H-N-J-E-S-U-S. Here he comes. <laughs> Giant's got the fall now. <laughs> and he won the victory because why? He had an experience that he knows that God could deliver. A man's not qualified to stand behind the platform on, or the pulpit until he's met God and had an experience. No person has a right to call themselves a Christian until first they've had an experience with God. Right? It was Abraham. After he was just an ordinary man that came down and dwelt in, in the Shinehire, down in the city of Ur, and he was just an ordinary believer. But one day God met him, and he spoke to him, and Abraham had an experience. And after Abraham had that experience, he could tell Sarah, go buy the bird eye and get all the pins ready. We're going to have the baby. I don't care how old you are. Why? He had had an experience first of talking face to face with God. He could call those things which were not as though they were after he had met God and had an experience. Not before it, after it. That's what's the matter with people tonight in these big cities and all cities in the world is because they refuse to receive the Holy Spirit. You Methodists and you Baptists and you Presbyterian and Catholic, you're human beings in which Christ died for. And you've got just as much right to these blessings as the Pentecostals have. But the only thing it is, you'll just sign your name to a church book instead of staying there until you've got an experience that God has changed you by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It takes an experience to accompany faith. You know where you've been. What well, David knew what he was talking about. He had met God. Abraham knew what he was talking about. For he had met God for 25 years. He endured because he believed that God that he had met took all shadows of doubt away from him. And he waited 25 years until that baby was born. Why, he had an experience of meeting God. Now, it was Moses that was raised up in all of the theology that Egypt could afford to give him. He was so smart until he could teach the masters of Egypt some wisdom. And he knew that he was born to Hebrews. He knew that he was born a deliverer. But look what a mess he made out of it when he tried within himself before he had an experience. He had all the schooling. He had the knowledge that he was a deliverer. But you see, he had never had any experience yet. But old brother, when he met God there in that burning bush, he knew what he was after then. He knew who he had believed. He could endure the rest of the 80 years as seeing him who is invisible. What a ridiculous sight to see a man. How faith meeting God will change a man. It'll make you do things that seem so crazy to the world. It'll make you act different. And you won't care what anybody says as long as you know what you've been talking to. Moses, running from Egypt, 40 years on the desert, but five minutes in the presence of that bush, the next morning here he goes down to Egypt. His wife sat in the saddle of a mule with a young and on each hip, and him a man 80 years old with an old stick in his hand, the whiskers are blowing. Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt to take over. A one-man invasion. The thing of it was he did it. Why? He had an experience. As a warrior and a young man, he run from the presence of Pharaoh without an experience. But with an experience, he walked into his face and told him, I'll smite this land with plagues unless you let these people go. 
He was afraid. Why? He had met God face to face. Brother, sister, there is a secret place that every believer should go. The back side of the desert there on those sacred sands. Oh, no doctor of theology, no Greek or Hebrew scholar, no school or seminary. They might twist you all up in these kind of things. But if you ever met God on those sacred sands, Satan can't put his feet on them sands. You know you met God. <laughs> Something real. What was it? You talked to God yourself. You had an experience. No man has a right to take the pulpit to preach the gospel unless he's had a backside of the desert experience. No man. No person has a right to call themselves a Christian until they've had a backside of the desert experience. It's still the backside of the desert. We call it upper room, but it's still the backside of the desert too. It's where you meet God. Oh, how ridiculous it is tonight to take people in the church just by baptizing them in the water and putting their name on the book. Oh, we need an old-fashioned St. Paul's revival and the Bible Holy Ghost back into the church again and a real old-fashioned meeting. An experience. After you've had an experience, then you know what you're talking about. That's when you've got faith. They might explain it and say, well, now, you ought to be a Methodist, you ought to be Pentecostal. They might talk you out of that. But when it comes to a place of that sacred spot where you met God... Brother, Satan can't put his dirty feet on that place. You know you talked to somebody there. You know something happened. Yes, sir. You were there. You know all about it. From then on, you can go and conduct yourself like a real Christian. Oh, the conduct today of people calling themselves Christians. No wonder our poor women are painting their faces and cutting off their hair and wearing little shorts and things. It's because they have failed to get that spot back there on that sacred sand gutter. That's right. No wonder our men are permitting it and smoking cigarettes and things. They fail to find that sacred spot gutter somewhere where God and man meet together. That's right. That's what we need tonight, my beloved friend. You know that. It's a disgrace on the days that we're living. That's the reason God cannot send a revival. He hasn't got much to build it on, friends. Amen. Yes. But he, I'm glad of this. These stones are able to... God's able these stones to raise children to Abraham. There's a few yet left around it in the shop and down at the works and so forth that still love God. He's always had a remnant of people. He's got them tonight that believe him no matter what anyone says, they believe it to be the truth. An experience, knowing God, knowing his power, loving him. Oh, after you've had an experience with God, what a different person it makes you. How it makes you know where you're standing. Even death itself can't separate you from it. No David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Gets our conduct right. Some time ago down in the South, they used to sell colored people for slaves when the, the Africans brought them over here to the Boers and sold them for slaves. And they would buy them in markets just like uh, you do used cars, human beings, and sell them and buy them. And brokers would come by and do so. One day a broker came by a certain plantation to buy some slaves. And, and this uh, owner said, um, I've got a few slaves I'd sell. He said, well, let me look them over. And he noticed the slaves, they were away from Mama and Papa and the baby and hubby. And they would never go back again. They were slaves and they'd die here in a strange land. Many times they were sorry and crying and all disturbed because they wouldn't never see their loved ones again, so they'd whip them to make them work. And they happened to notice one young man, they didn't have to whip him. His head was back and his chest out, and he's just right at the dock. And this slave buyer said, I'd like to buy that slave. But the owner said, he's not for sale. Said, why is he for sale? 
said, uh, is he the boss over the rest of them? He said, no, he's just a slave. Well, said, perhaps maybe you feed him better than you feed the rest of the slaves. And no, he eats out in the galley with the rest of them. Or said, what makes him so much different from the rest of them? He said, I wandered a long time myself till I found out that boy's daddy over in the homeland is the king of the tribe. Though he's an alien and in a far country, yet he knows he's a king's son, and he conducts himself like one. Oh, though we be criticized and called crazy, yet we are sons and daughters of the king. We are aliens. But yet we know that our Father is rich with houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. We're the child of a king. Let's conduct ourselves like one. Let's straighten ourselves up. Let's face the enemy. And know that God is our Father. He's the king. Though we're in a world of fashion, education, theology, that has nothing to do with it. Stick your chest out. Walk forward, believe God. Certainly, have an experience when you're born in that royal family. And if you've had that experience, you conduct yourself like that. Certainly. Now, it was uh, the Philip one time when he went over to find Nathaniel. It was he could go to and tell Nathaniel after he'd heard Jesus say, Your name is Simon, and your father's name is Jonas. After he had had that experience, he could go tell Philip or Nathaniel what great things he saw Jesus do. What? Before, after he had seen. After he had seen Jesus do that. These apostles here. And before Jesus told them to have faith in God and to move mountains, he showed what he could do. He cursed the tree and then let them see it withered. See, after they'd seen the tree wither, then he said, have faith in God. After he had done something, after he had proved what he was, and when Nathaniel had on his road back and had been discussing with Philip and saying, now nothing good could come out of Nazareth, but when he walked up into the presence of Jesus and Jesus said, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, he said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. It was after Jesus said that, that he said, Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. After he had had an experience of seeing it, he knew then that he was the Son of God. Jesus said, Because I told you I saw you under the tree, do you believe me? It was the woman that was fussing with Jesus about her religion and his religion, sitting at the well. You say you're greater than our father Jacob? Well, you're a Jew. There's segregation in this land. You ain't got no business talking to me. And uh, you say people should worship at Jerusalem, and we say in this mountain? See, she was fussing with him about her religion. She wanted to hold a little debate with him. She didn't really realize who he was until he said, Go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, You said the truth. You've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Thou set us right. It is after he said that that the woman left her water pot and ran into the city. And he said, come see a man who told me what I've done. Is it this the Messiah? After he had told her. She didn't want to argue with him then. After he had made himself known. It was after the woman with the blood issue had touched his garment and went and set out believing in her heart that she had faith for her healing. And it was after Jesus looked around and said, Who touched me? And no one spoke. And he looked out at the audience and told the little woman what her trouble was and she was healed. It was after that that everybody then began to touch his garment or they were testing their faith too. The world wants to see something real. I'm hungry for real things. I'm hungry to see a church stand in this last day. I'm hungry to see a good old-fashioned Pentecostal body of Christ rise in the power of the Holy Ghost, calling right, right, and wrong, wrong. My heart longs to see it. 
The little remnants that's waiting on are not waiting to see how big we can make our denomination. They're not waiting to see how well we can dress or how big our church we can build. They're waiting to see us manifest the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in love and power. They're waiting to see the time that when the one, this two, this trinity and all together will break down their little walls and put their hands in each other's hands and say, we are brothers. It's waiting for the assemblies and the holiness, Pentecostal holiness in the church of God for the Mexicans and the colored people and the, the Japanese and the white and all together to join ranks as one great body of Jesus Christ. They don't care how good we educate our preachers. They're wanting to see reality. And they've got an experience that there is a reality. That's what we need, an experience. I've seen a coldest-hearted man i ever seen in my life brought to Christ for something like it not long ago. Up here in these New England states were a hunt. i got a good friend. He thinks he's sitting right back here tonight. <clears throat> He was one of the best hunters I ever followed. And I love to hunt. No, not to kill the game. It's to it's just get alone with God. Get away from all the gasoline and cigarette smoke and all the carrying on so you can be alone with God. Way up in the cathedral on top of the mountain. Miles and miles from nowhere. Then God comes down. You can hear him whispering through the pines. You can hear him crying in the wolf yonder. You can hear him in a deer when he snorts. Well, you can just hear him everywhere. As the eagle screams, you can watch him, listen at him. And I used to hunt up here in the White Mountains with a good friend. and He was a good hunter, a wonderful shot, and a nice fellow. But he was the most meanest man i ever seen. He's cruel-hearted. He used to shoot little fawns just to make me feel bad. And he'd take little, a little fawn as a little baby deer. And now, if the law says you can kill a fawn, that's all right. There's nothing against it. Abraham killed a calf and said it to God. So, but not to just keep shooting them just to be mean. See, it's your, it's your perversion, your attitude. And so he, uh, he would just shoot those little fawns. And I said, Bert, don't do that. You're the meanest guy i ever seen. And he said, oh, Billy, get next to yourself. You're just a chicken-hearted creature. Well, I said, it don't take a chicken-hearted preacher to know right from wrong. I said, you shouldn't do that. And one year while I went up there, he had him a little whistle. And he could take that little whistle and go just like a little baby deer crying for its mammy. And I said, oh, you're not going to use that, sir. Oh, he said, get next to yourself, Billy. And we went hunting that day, a very fine hunter. I loved to follow with him. And we'd separate in the woods. And you never have to think about hunting him up. You know where he was at. And... So we would hunt until about noon together, and then we would go to separate and go back down different mountains to come back to our camp. And it's uh, even just before about 11.30, he was walking in front. We hadn't seen a track at all, and there's about a six-inch snow on the ground, good tracking weather, but the deer season had been in for quite a while, and much shooting going on. The deers were all afraid. We call it spooks. They were scared, stayed in the thickets and under the brush piles and wherever they could get, especially when the daylight was on. So he kind of stooped down at a little opening, and the first thing you know, I seen him reach into his coat, and I thought he was going to get his lunch, and we'd have our lunch together. We packed hot chocolate and, and some sandwiches, or if we got lost, and then he, um, he, he reached in there, and he pulled out this little old whistle, and he gave it a little cry. And when he did just across the opening, about the distance of this place, a mother doe stood up. Now, that's the mother deer, the doe. Oh, she was a beautiful animal. And I'll never forget how she looked. She raised up those great, big, beautiful ears standing up, her big brown eyes, and the veins looked like in her face. You could just see them. And he looked around to me with that lizard-looking eyes, and he said, kind of he pulled himself down, I thought, Bert, you won't do that. And I heard the, the lever come back, and he pulled the bolt back and throw the shell up into that 30 6 rifle. I thought, Bert, surely you won't. So he squealed again like that. And the old mother deer, now that's very unusual for them to raise up like that, especially that time of day in hunting season. She walked right out into the opening. Now, any of you brethren in hunts know they won't do that. And so she, what was it, old? What was she standing there? And Bert moved. And the deer saw him. 
Did she run? No. She stood there. What was it? She wasn't slaying church. She was a mother. There was something in her that was real. It was real love. A baby was crying. She had something in her that called and answered. She was a mother. And she seen the hunter. She quivered a few times. And she looked again for that baby. I seen Bert level that rifle down that scope. Hair come right across her heart. I thought, oh, he was a dead shot. I thought, oh, my, in another second or two, he'll blow her loyal heart plumb through her. I thought, how can you do it, Bert? How can you be so mean? That mother out there displaying real mother love. She ain't a hypocrite. She's really, there's a baby in trouble. Death or no death. She's a mother. I thought, how can you do it? That big 180 grain bullet that close would blow her 15 feet and blow her heart plumb through her. I thought, Bert, how can you do that? You cruel hearted man. Shoot that poor mother's heart right out of her with a heart like that so loyal. So loyal. I turned my back. I thought, oh, God, have mercy on that man. How can he be so cruel? I waited, waited. The gun never fired. And I turned to look, and the gun was going like this. He looked around at me, and the tears running down his cheek. He threw the gun on the ground. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Tell me about that Jesus. There on that bank of snow, I led that cruel-hearted man to Christ. Why? Not my preaching. No, but because he seen something real. He seen something that was not put on. He seen something genuine. Now I'm telling you tonight, friend, the world is looking for something genuine. Not a man-made creed, but a Jesus who lives and reigns and brings love and peace and joy and breaks down differences to make man love man. And women love women. The world wants to see something real. Brother, sister, God got it for you. It's here right now. Just meet that real thing. Just become as much Christian as she was a mother. I don't care. They can call you holy roller. They can call you fanatic. You'll stand in the face of the enemy and declare that you love God. Real faith. Think of it. That's what we need tonight, friends, is something real. Let us bow our heads just a moment now. And now I wonder, while we're waiting a minute, would there be someone in the building here tonight would raise your hand saying, God, give me the kind of a spirit of Christianity that makes me as loyal to Christ as that mother dear was for her baby. Lord, I've been a church member for years. I profess to be a Christian, but really, I haven't got that real something. I need a real faith. I need a born-again experience, God. I need those sacred sands that will change me from a cowardly doubter to a real faith warrior that can take God at his word. You want to be remembered in prayer, raise up your hand, will you, all in the building? God bless you, that's good. Way in the balcony is the second balcony up there. Raise your hands. You say, God, remember me. God bless you. In the third balcony, say, remember me. God bless you, each one now. He sure he'll do it. He sees your hand. Say, oh, Lord, God, be merciful. Give me love in my heart, Lord. Now, I've been very zealous in my denomination. You should be. That's good. But, oh, don't never put that ahead of Christ. That's where the church is slipping tonight. It's getting away over on creed. You don't do that. Come back to Christ. Think of it now. Say, God created me a love. Give me faith, just as much faith to stand for you and to accept my healing tonight, too, as that mother dear had to stand there fearless because something within her was real. Lord God, the service is yours, Father. There's been two or three hundred hands go up. They love you. And they want something real. They're tired just trotting around just going from church to church or place to place or living in alleys with the riffraff and out in the gambling places and, or maybe trying to hide around the corner and keep the pastor and 
someone else has seen them do things that's wrong. Oh, God, may they walk right out in the open now. They raise their hands. They want something real. Give them something real, Lord. Give them Jesus, that he might give them the Holy Spirit and fill them with his goodness and his power and his love. That will make them have an undying faith in the Lamb of God. Grant it, Lord, they're yours. Thou said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that comes, I'll give him eternal life and raise him up at the last day. Then you're here, Lord. You're drawing. And Jesus, you said these words. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. And shall not come to the judgment, but pass from death unto life. What did they do when they raised their hands, Lord? They defied the laws of gravitation. Why, there's a spirit in them that let them know that they were wrong in a spirit by them, the Holy Spirit, saying, Child, accept me. And they raised their hand to the Creator. Sure, you put their name on the book, Lord. Now fill them with the Holy Spirit. Give them an experience right now, Lord, in this meeting tonight that they'll never forget it. That they can go from here knowing that Jesus is raised from the dead. And he lives and he lives in their hearts. Give these pastors, Lord, a double potion of faith. They're shepherds, Lord. They're the one who leads the flock. Oh, stir these pastors tonight, Lord. Stir your pastors. You'll stir the whole city. Grant it, Lord. Do, Father. Give them a solid faith tonight, Lord. May their churches just be like anvil blocks, just sparks of salvation flying every way, beating and molding material for the Master's use. Grant it, Lord. Now may Jesus come. Present him himself tonight, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We've just been talking, Father, how in the early days, how you made yourself known to your church. By speaking to Peter, that ignorant fisherman, tell him who he was and what his father's name was. Then you, after you told him that and he believed you, you give him the keys to the kingdom. After he believed it, after you told him. Nathaniel said, why did you ever know me, Rabbi? I said, well, before he, Philip called you. And you said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. We know that the vine does not bear fruit. It only gives life to the branch, and the branch bears fruit. We're told by your word that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you made yourself known to the Jews in that day, at the closing of their age, and you never manifested yourself in that manner to the Gentiles, then, God, when you make a decision, it has to be forever the same, or you cannot change. You don't get smarter. You're infinite to begin with. And then, Father, we pray that after you promise it, that tonight you'll manifest it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the audience tonight, brother, sister, you that raised your hand and meet me at the healing service, I want you to come up here. I want to pray with you a little bit after that. I'm so glad for you. Don't you feel good? How many knows that good old song, I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Don't you love to worship him now after the message is over? Worship him. Now let's just sing that. Brother Claire, come here maybe. I will praise him, praise the Lamb for sinners slain. All right. I will praise him.
I want all you sitting next to you. Don't leave your seat up the balcony you know. all. Reach over to somebody sitting next to you, to your side, right, left, front, and back. Shake hands. You Methodists and Baptists. Let's just make be real friends now. Turn right around and shake hands. Oh, my God. something to your heart just takes all the old fear and doubt away and bears it over in the seal of forgiveness and know that that lovely Jesus stands here. Outstretched arms, come unto me, all the ends of the world, and be blessed. I'm looking at this little audience tonight as I'm thinking. You know this little way it's seated here tonight? It's a cross. Here's one wing, there's the other wing, there's the foot, and here's the head. Just exactly a cross. Oh, don't I love him. Don't you love him. Now we love him. Now we say, uh, someone might say, Brother Branham, that's just emotion. No, it isn't. It's spirit. It's real Holy Spirit. There's not another religion in the world. All the great religions. Christianity is third or fourth down the line. Mohammed religion is more in numbers than Christianity. Buddha is far advanced to Christianity. Christianity is way back because why? We fail to do what Jesus said to do. It's the only religion that's right. It's the only one. Every one of their founders, Mohammed, is dead. You can visit his grave. There's a white horse stands in his grave to change guards every four hours. Been there for 2,000 years. He's in the grave. Buddha, he died about 2,300 years ago, buried in Japan. But look, Jesus rose. <laughs> you say, did he do it? Yes. How can you prove it? Just wait a few minutes and see. If he won't make his promise good, then he, he hasn't risen from the dead. But if he makes his promise good, then we're sure he's here. By faith, we believed it for 2,000 years. We're at the end now, the end of the Gentile dispensation. He's sure to seal it now. Oh, how I love him. How I love him. God is love. And you just can't do nothing but love when God comes into you. It's love, brotherly love for one another. Now, in on the earth, when Jesus was here, now, God is almighty, and he doesn't get smarter. He's the same all the time. Do you believe that? The human race gets smarter. The Bible said they would, they'd be weaker and wiser. But God is, is infinite. Do you believe that? We are finite. We keep uh, each year while well, our science are moving on and we build a better automobile and our education is better, but God doesn't get any smarter. He's perfect to begin with. So then when God, a certain situation rises and God's called on the scene to act, the way God acts that time, he has to act every time. When the same circumstances rises again, he has to act the same way he did the first time or he acted wrong the way he acted the first time. In other words, if there was a sinner calling for mercy and God saved that sinner, the next sinner calls, God's got to act the same way. If God, if a, a man is dying and the doctors can't help him and he calls on God and calls him to the scene and God heals that person, he's got to act the same way again. See? Before he didn't, he did wrong when he acted the first time. Now, when Jesus was God in flesh, we believe that, the manifestation he was here to manifest himself in the flesh. Jesus was the body, the Son of God, 
God dwelled in Christ. Now, Jesus said himself, the Son can do nothing in himself, St. John 5, 19, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Did you ever read that? That he didn't do nothing until Father God showed him a vision on what to do. I see the Bible's infallible. Jesus said the Scriptures cannot be broken. Jesus said that. Now, and then if, if Jesus said, I can do nothing until the Father shows me first what to do. The Father worketh, I worketh the other two. In other words, he acted out in drama what the Father showed him to do. Watch each case. Every time you find it the same way. Unless it was the people's faith. Now, how we notice that then again, we find he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, the Father that sent him was with him and in him. The Father that sent him went with him and in him. Well, the Jesus that sends us goes with us and in us. See? So, Jesus shows us what to do. Now, when he declared himself to the Jews, take St. John the first chapter, what was the first thing he done? He declared himself by telling Peter who he was and what his father's name was. Next, he, he declared himself to another Jew. It's the next day. And here come the Samuel up. He said, he is a light, no guile. He said, when did you know me, Rabbi? I said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree and saw you. He said, you are the Son of God. But there were those who stood by and said, he's a fortune teller. He's the Elzebub. He's an evil person. And what did Jesus say? I'll forgive you for that. But otherwise, like this, someday the Holy Ghost is coming. And when it comes and does the same thing, one word against it will never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. Now notice, there's only three generations of people. That's Ham, Shem, and Japheth's people, if we believe the Bible. The world was destroyed in the Andalusian flood. And that was Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, that was Jew, Gentile, and Samaritan. Half Jew and Gentile. Now, when he was on earth, the Jews that had believed him had been looking for him for years. When he come, he, he, their eyes were blind. But see, that's the way he manifested himself to the Jews. The true Jews said, that's the Messiah sign. When he went by the woman at the well, which was a Samaritan, what did he do? The same sign he showed to the, to the Jews. Go get your husband and come here. She said, now we're trained. We know that when the Messiah cometh, you know what? That woman knows more about God than half the ministry of the United States does. Yet she was a prostitute. She said, we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. She ran into the city and said, Come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? I remember. He never did that to a Gentile. He forbid his disciples to go to a Gentile. Because we were heathens in them days. We hadn't been trained. Now we've had 2,000 years of training, and we're at the end of the road, just like they were. You remember the Samaritan woman, our father Jacob? See? They were just an off-breed, half-breed between the two. Now, notice. Now this is the end of the Gentile age. Now listen real close before we close. The prophet said there would come a day that wouldn't be called day nor night. What would that be? Kind of a dismal, foggy, dark day. Is that right? And he said in the evening time it shall be light. Now what happened? Civilization started in the east and traveled westward. It's all the way to the west coast. The east and west has met together now. What kind of a light shined, the gospel light? What did it shine like on the eastern people? Jesus performing these things to the eastern people. We are the western people. Now, the day has went through the Gentile age where we could see enough light to walk and believe Jesus and, and to do the things that, that we think is right and build our churches and have denominations, education, so forth. That's all right. But in the evening, it shall be light. The fog's cleared away. And the same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost has been kept down through the Lutheran age, through the Wesley age, and through the other ages is now beginning to shine. On this Gentile people in the last days, with Jesus, who is the light, working in his church as the vine among the branches, producing and performing the very same things he did when he was here. Where that was the last sign of the end of the Jews. I believe we got Sputniks in the sky, handwriting on the wall, man's heart failing for fear, perplexed of time, distressed between nations. One extra drink of vodka and we could all go to ashes before morning. You know that. Not a thing to keep them from doing it. New York, just take one. They got a bomb that'll blow 175 feet deep, 100 and something miles square. 
Where you go to hide at, you couldn't dig deep enough. The concussion gets you hundreds and hundreds of feet below the ground. But there's a high deep place. It's made out of feathers under his wings. We abide. And remember, if the end time could come before morning, and anyone knows the church goes before that happens, how close is he coming? See, before Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, and as the days of Lot, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Not one drop of rain fell to Noah went in the ark. What did the angel say to Lot? Hasten, come hither, for I can do nothing till you've come hither. No fire could fall on Sodom until Lot was out. And no bomb can strike until Jesus takes the church. He's gone. Might be at any minute. And look, just one more thing. Excuse me for keeping you so long. I want you to notice, just Abraham, who was the elected. Do you believe God's got an elected church? And then a church natural. Trying to call it now. The elected church is already in. Abraham was the representative of the elected church, living poor out on the desert and so forth. But notice, just before the destruction of Sodom, there was an angel came to him. Is that right? And the angel was talking to Abraham, had his back turned to the tent, and Sarah was on the inside of the tent. And the angel told Abraham, I'm going to visit you according to time of life. And Sarah, in her heart, laughed inside the tent. The angel with his back to the tent said, why did Sarah laugh? What kind of telepathy was that? Remember, that angel had the last message, not before the water fell, but before the fire fell. And who was that angel? Christ. Abraham called him Elohim, Jehovah, Almighty, the Logos. Sure, he was God. And here it is, just before the destruction of fire again, that same angel is amongst his people today, calling to you church members, come out, come out from among us. That's right. Get away from it quickly. She's going to sink. Just as certain, when I went into India here not long ago, they said, they had, said the must, earthquake must be over, the birds are flying back. A day before the earthquake come, they didn't know nothing about it, but India don't have fences like we have. They have rock fences and great big towers and so forth. They live in rock houses. They're poor. And the birds build their nests in there, and the cattle stand around them for shade. But the day before that earthquake come, you couldn't get a cow or sheep near that fence. They all stood right out in the middle of the field. And all the birds left their nests and went out in the forest and got in the trees. Why? God, the same God that took them to the ark, could take them away from them walls. He took his animals out in the field. Then when the earthquake and them walls fell, the animals was away from it. Oh, brother, if God can warn birds and animals to get away from the danger, fly away from these old walls of Babylon. They're crushing. They're coming down. The Holy Ghost is warning. Get out in the middle of God's grace and raise up your hands to Christ. Here I am, Lord. Do it now. You believe. And I believe tonight that he'll give us the great meeting. Now, let us pray again, Father. Oh, I'm so happy tonight and thrilled and enthused to see you shake these New England states before you change my ministry. Oh, Lord, I'm so glad that hundreds has received you. And I pray now that you'll grant tonight, when you got those disciples coming from Emmaus inside the room and closed the door, you did something the way you did it before you were crucified. They knew it was you. And they run back saying, our hearts burn within us. God grant tonight that you'll come and do the same things that you did when you were here on earth. You said you would. You promised it. And then when we go home tonight, we'll say, did not our hearts burn within us? Truly, he's raised from the dead. He still lives. Two thousand years hasn't aged him a bit. He lives forevermore. And because he lives, we can live also. Granted, Father, we humble our hearts and submit our spirits to you. This church, their spirits, Lord, that they might be able to touch the border of your garment, the great high priest. Lord God, I surrender myself to you under a divine gift that you would use my eyes and lips to see and speak that which would be appropriate in your kingdom. And for the glory of God, we ask this. Amen. All right. We can't get them all up here at once. We'll see if we can get a few up here. About how many should we stand here? Let's see. Eight, did you say? Who has eight number one prayer card? All right. We've got them all lined up. All right. Now, here is the case, friend. Now, if you will, each one just be seated and be just as reverent. Now, no matter where you are, 
Now, this great closing moment. Now, this all this rejoicing we've done, all this joy we have in our hearts, all this faith that we say we believe him and love him, what good is it if he's the God of history and not the same God today? We had a George Washington one time, a Abraham Lincoln, but that's history. They're gone. They can't come to the White House and act today, but not so with Jesus. He lives. Now, does he live? Well, if he lives, I want to ask you. Your healing is already purchased. Do you know that? Your salvation, you just have to receive it. Now, what does he do? Make himself present to confirm his word. Then your faith in him, you just accept your healing like you do your salvation. Like those people, I'll go raise your hands. Accept it. Now, do you realize my position? This is right at 10 years around the world through witch doctors. I've had witch doctors that sit and go through the enchantments and say they'd have a storm to blow me away and a storm coming just whirl around and around. I just kept preaching about 50,000 people and, I, and about 15 witch doctors on each side going through all kinds of enchantments, bleeding themselves and putting blood on them and everything, calling up evil spirits and truly here come clouds and come up and I just kept on preaching. Then I thought the little place was going to blow away. I stopped laid my Bible down. I said, Lord God, you made the heavens and earth. And then clouds moved right back and the sun began to shine. And 30,000, or 20,000 that afternoon rushed to the altar of communism and received Christ as personal Savior. He's, all, he's been so good to me. Now, surely he won't let me down tonight. Praise him. But you see what I'm doing? Now, the word that declares it is the truth. Then the word could be found false, or me telling something it's not so. But even if it wouldn't work, the word's still right anyhow. I can be wrong. My, I could be all messed up and God wouldn't even speak through me. But he has done it. And I trust him that he will do it again, for by his grace he does it. I'll be real reverent. And if he will come and act just the same as he did when he was here on earth. How many of you say, it'll make me believe him and love him? And if I don't even get the prayer line, I'll be healed anyhow. Just raise your hand and say, I'll be... I'll be. As far as I know, the only person that I recognize in the building out in front of me here is Brother Stadsfist sitting here. And I might know one of those ministers, the one right behind him, I think I do, and Brother Bose sitting here. Rest of your strangers. Now, here's a beautiful Bible picture. A woman and a man meeting for the first time. This is our first time meeting. If it is, it's so the people would know he's raised up your hands. So I've never seen her. She's just a woman come out of the audience. Well, now, if she needs healing, what if I just lay my hand over and say, Lady, you need healing. You're going to get well. That would be all right. She could believe that and it'd be all right. But then she could have a little doubt. And you could too. But if the Lord Jesus will come and act like he did to the woman at the well, tell her where her trouble is or something that's in her life that she knows that I know nothing about, then that shows it has to be a complete miracle. That's more of a miracle than having a paralytic sitting here to rise up. It certainly is. In the supernatural. Now, if the Lord Jesus, you know me not knowing you, and this is just a picture like it was the woman at the well, a man and a woman. And if he will tell me, you might be a Christian, you might be an infidel, you might be a critic, you might be sick, I, I don't know. I have no idea. But he does know. And if he will reveal it now to me, then you'll all have come to supernatural power somewhere. Would you believe it was God? May he grant it. I'm just talking to you like our Lord did to woman. See, I say now you are a Christian because you're aware that something's going on. Just started just now. If that's right, raise up your hand. See, between me and you coming right around you is that light that you see in that picture. I suppose they had it to Moving on the lady. The woman's aware that something's going on. Humble, sweet, feeling. Now I see her move away from me and she's real extremely nervous. That's right. That's what's wrong with you. Nervousness. See, you're pacing the floor. Now, that's right, isn't it? If that's right, wave your hand like this. 
Do you believe now? You say, Brother Brandon, you could have guessed that. All right. Let's see what else the Lord would say. Whether you will or not, I don't know. Be mine. Yes, the audience can still hear my voice. The lady, I see her nervous. She's all, oh, it's caused by, she got a fall. She hurt her back. That's what caused it. Another thing, you've been interested in a person you're praying for or something. It's a young man. And that young man is bothered with spiritual trouble. He's all nervous and scared. He's just mentally shook up. It's demon oppression. When you go to him, tell him not to worry because he's going to get over it. And you are over yours now. Your faith has made you a You believe him to be Christ? Now, you know that there has to be some kind of a supernatural being here. Now, if you believe it's Christ, I'd be real rare. I suppose, sister, we're strangers to one another. Do you believe that the first time is ever in the meeting? All right. Now, if the Lord God will let me know what you want of him, would you believe he'd be interested enough then to let you, he's trying to let you know that he loves you? All right. Me. Just be real reverent. Uh, I will you. So you got something wrong with your hand and your back. It was caused by a bus door closing on you. You're healed. Stand up on your feet. Your back trouble's gone. All right. What did she touch? I don't know the woman. I have never seen her in my life. She knows that. But you're healed now. You're all right. God bless you. See? She touched the high priest. Now, you out there, you start doing the same thing. Just believe him now. Have faith. Hold out. A lady, you have complications. You got many things wrong with one thing you're suffering with a weakness. You have weakness. Amen. And you have real weak spells. And then that's been going on for some time. Yeah, for a number of years. Since you start into the menopause time of life, you begin to get extremely nervous before your hair begins to turn. And then the great thing that you're interested in oh, is somebody else. That's your husband. He's in the hospital. Crippled, and you've got a handkerchief there for him. Lord God, I pray that you'll move that curse and make the man well through Jesus Christ Jesus. Don't you doubt, go on your road and rejoice, believe with all your heart. Be real reverent, keep believing, don't doubt, have faith. The audience can hear my voice. This woman doesn't speak English. She's just a little bit. She can just barely speak English. And uh, you're not here for yourself. You're here for someone else. And I see lots of water in a great dark shadow of country. You're praying for somebody who is across the sea. And that is your sister. And she's in Russia. And she has cancer in the stomach. Yes. She's behind the iron curtain. Yes. And she's unsaved. Oh, yes. so thus pay it the Lord. Yes. Lay that baby to her. In the Lord God, they bring you. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Do you believe with all your heart? Believe that God will grant the request of the if thou, just a moment, something happened in the audience just now. Or it's the lady here with her hand up. Right here, she's suffering with scientists, headache scientists. You're healed now. Jesus Christ makes you well. Have faith in God. I don't know what you do, a lady. I've never seen her in my life. But God knows her. 
just have faith in God. If thou canst believe. You believe me to be his servant in the presence of Christ? You are suffering with a nervous trouble, really extremely nervous, and you got wrong with the liver, which makes spots before your eyes and coating on your tongue. Billion spells happen to you. I see you very sick at times. That's right. And then also you have a tumor. That tumor's on your breast. You believe you're going to be healed? And go. God makes you well. Lady, right back there, don't bite your fingers anymore. You're suffering with a nervous trouble that made you have stomach trouble. You believe that God will make you well? You accept your healing? You do? Raise up your hand if you do. All right, it's over now. God bless you. Have faith. Hey, young fella. You're a mighty fine boy. You believe me to be this son? I don't know you, lady. Here's a beautiful picture of like the well, a Samaritan woman, and a Jewish man. And here is a colored woman, white man. But God let him know that there's no difference in the people. We all come from Adam. The country we was raised in changed our colors, has nothing to do with our spirit and soul. We're all preachers of God. Do you believe me still there? The reason I spoke to that woman there is that stomach trouble, same thing you have. You have a stomach trouble too. That's right. See, Satan knew he was going to be defeated here. He thought he could, he could get by there, but he failed. To let you know that you're, that you're already healed, do you believe me to be his prophet? Yes. You do. You're not from this city. You believe that you're suffering with a break too, a nervous break. That's right. You know, go back to Boston, be made well. Love the Lord. Your name's Sarah. Sarah Sell. Return back to Boston, Jesus Christ is made well. If thou canst believe. I don't know you, lady. God knows us both. You believe that he would heal you? You believe he could let me know about you? I'd be real reverend. There's just so many of you getting healed out there, and I can't tell which is which. Just going everywhere. Just pulling this with heart. This colored lady standing here is making the colored people have faith when they see that other lady needs. Sitting right back out here on the first row, trouble with your shoulder. Do you believe God will make you well, lady? Do you believe it? All right. The colored lady said, lay your hand on that lady next to you. She's got trouble in her side. Do you believe that God will make you well, lady? All right. Put your hand on the next one for you. You've got heart trouble and high blood pressure. You believe, lady? All right, stand up on your feet and receive it. Have faith. Have faith. You're suffering with a nervous trouble, too. you got heart trouble. And you got trouble in your colon. Or the doctor told you that. That's right. And you got tumor in the head. That's right. Miss Elsie there? Oh. Yeah, and you live in the Bronx. Yes. So return back your heel. Jesus Christ makes you well. That face you know. That back trouble left you while she was being prayed for. Just go right on here and just rejoice and you're already here. Right. 
your shed of the death of cancer, will you believe God healed you? Just keep walking. Oh, you believe that God one day heals you right there? Would you believe it? Just keep rejoicing and thanking God. You didn't get any sick from arthritis, but you won't have it no more. Just keep walking. Jesus Christ makes you well. You believe out there, God? Yeah, Think about who you're seeing right now. 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 